tad warm in here. But I preached out 95 degree weather and it was soaking wet when we got finished, so it could be worse. Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 14. The Lord God speaking now to Noah. And he says to him in verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of it shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. The door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. Behold, even I, behold I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to, des to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, cattle after their kind, creeping every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shalt thou come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, Thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. I like the obedience of Noah, and was unquestioning, and to the point, Noah did exactly what God told him to do. Notice verse number 18. God said, I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. The only way that man has ever been able to approach God is by means of a covenant. An agreement. Literally in the Hebrew text, it means to cut a covenant. That's what the word means. In plain words, a sacrifice must be made. Blood must be shed in order for the covenant to be ratified and to be brought and be binding on both parties. Noah was instructed to build an ark. Almost every culture on the face of this earth that had advanced to the point to where it had a written language has some or has some type of story about a flood and about uh, someone who went through the flood and passed over to the other side into a new world. So the knowledge of the flood is essentially universal to all mankind on the face of the earth. Regardless of how perverted the facts may be, the simple fact is that most of mankind has in his history or in his, in his heritage the story of a the flood. They have found Noah's Ark. In the search in Ararat, back in the 30s, a photograph was taken of the ark. Pieces of the wood of the ark have been brought back. Numerous excavation, ex expeditions have been sent to, to Mount Ararat. And they have, I do believe, with all of my heart, found the ark. And I'm pretty well satisfied with that. Whether they found it or not is irrelevant. Because if God said there was an ark, there was an ark. Amen. But when you go back in history and trace, uh, when you study anthropology, and in studying anthropology you trace the origins of man, you will find that the seed of civilization did indeed start in the valley of Mesopotamia because the ancient Egyptians who were part of North Africa had much that they owed to the, to the valley of Mesopotamia. And it was there the scripture says that Noah and his descendants migrated from the top of Ararat after the flood that destroyed all mankind upon the face of the earth, the plains of Shinar, the city of Babylon. So here we read in the book of Genesis chapter number 6 that God said, Noah, build an ark. For I indeed intend to destroy all flesh upon the face of the earth that breathes. And God did exactly as he said he would. This ark, therefore, became the savior of mankind. This boat, and that's what it was. It was not a ship. It did not ply the waters under guidance. It was simply a sailing, if, any, if a good analogy would be a barge. Something flat bottomed that would sail across the ocean that would be tossed and sent with the wind in whichever direction that it was blown is the way it would go. It was not guided by Noah. It was simply guided by the elements and the hand of God. Amen. The ark, therefore, became an instrument of salvation Amen. for those eight souls who entered into it, and all of mankind was spared. But I want to look for this morning on the ark as a type, 
because the ark is one of the most beautiful types in scripture of quite a few things. First of all, I want you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 17 and verse number 26. And let's look at it as a type of the second act of the Son of God. The scripture says in Luke chapter 17 and verse 26, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37, Matthew says, As the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, verse 39, note carefully, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. A lot of folks today have given up on the coming of the Son of Man. That's probably one of the saddest things to happen to the church of God in the last 20 years. Amen. I can see it everywhere. It no longer brings the excitement from a congregation when you tell them that the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ is near at hand. Amen. As you see that day approach, my dear friend, Amen. lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. These people in the book of Genesis before the flood, my friend, had totally lost any faith in the coming of the Lord or any faith in trusting God. And so when Noah began to build his ark, I'm sure that Noah on many occasions would stand there on the platform and offer to anyone who wanted to come and enter into that ark total safety and freedom from the wrath to come. But my friend, no one heeded his voice. The scripture says in verse 39, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. If I can say anything about that text, it is this. They were willfully ignorant of the impending judgment of God. Amen. They had put it out of their mind as so much ranting and raving by the fanatic Noah about the coming judgment of the Lord. My friend, please hear me this morning. Don't you put it out of your mind. That day is nearly approaching, Amen. and you better be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. The Bible says one of the things that characterized the day of Noah was the fact that they married and gave in marriage. Over 50% of our marriages are ending in divorce. Most people today have numerous marriages, two, three, or even four marriages. I believe the multiplicity of marriages is what the scripture is referring to when it says they were marrying and giving in marriage. Amen. Marriage, my friend, today is a joke for Amen. most people who walk down the aisle. Amen. I want you to notice another type of the ark. The scripture says that it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And then immediately follows, he says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. It was characterized by an evil world. Amen. Evil had reached its top. Evil was as bad as man could ever get. And God said, enough is enough. I shall wipe them from the face of the earth. And he did. He smote them with water and they died. A loving, merciful, gracious God, one that you would not expect to do such a thing, had killed all of mankind from the earth. But now look at Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 14. Here is another type, and a beautiful indeed. It says in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. I want you to call your attention to verse 14 carefully. For here it says, You are to pitch the ark without and within. The Hebrew word for pitch is kafir. The same word is translated atonement in the Old Testament. Amen. The atonement was one of the most solemn, grandest things that ever happened to a human being. It is the fact that God would cover that man's sins. Amen. Atonement does not mean at one moment. Atonement means that God has taken a guilty sinner. Amen. And that guilty sinner is no longer held accountable for his Amen. sin. For God has covered his sin. Amen. That Bible says the ark of God in the Old Testament was covered on the outside and on the inside to keep the waters of judgment from entering in. To make it possible for the ark to float above the death and destruction that were lying beneath it. It's a marvelous thing to think that the God of the universe, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. has covered my sin. Amen. It's a big deal to me. Amen. For in 1973 when God saved me, I brought a whole lot of sins to the cross of Amen. Calvary. 
Here in the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14, it says that it was a covering, an atonement, a cleaning up, a passing over, and it was sealing the ark so that it would float above the judgment and wrath of God. Think of the waters as they lapped against the side of that ark. Think of the wrath of God as it came upon humanity and men and women began to die by their hundreds of thousands, by their millions. You can hear them as they beat on the side of that ark, as they screamed and tried to get into that ark. But God had shut the door. And when God shut the door, no man could open that door. I fear, my friend, that we are very near the time when God is going to shut the door again. And when that door is shut, no man will open it. When the church is gone, it's gone. Amen. And you'll never be part of it. Amen. I thank God I'm part of the bride of Christ. Amen. I thank God I'm in the ark. And I'm safe in the ark. Amen. And that wrath of God will never touch me. I hear them screaming. I hear them pounding. I hear them begging. And I hear those waves as they are coming now and lashing against the side of that ark. And thanks be unto God that I'm fit, I'm saved, and I'm saved, my friend, forever Amen. from the judgment of God. Amen. Notice something else about this in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 14. The Bible said, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And then he describes what he wants made. He made for them a safe, sure, secure place. He made for them a place where the storm that raged could not touch them. He made for them a place where they would be carried over the judgment of God and be set free on the other world. You know this, they entered into that ark from one world, and when they came out of it, they went into another. Amen. They went into the ark from a world that was lost and condemned, and then they ex exited to the ark and walked out into a brand new, fresh world. Amen. The day that God saved my soul, and put me in Jesus Christ, Amen. I came out of an old Amen. world. Amen. And thanks be unto God, Amen. when that ark passes over the judgment of this world, I'll come out into a brand new world. And it won't be made by the hands of man. Amen. It will not be the product of man's ability and ingenuity. Amen. It'll be a world that he alone can create. Amen. Notice something else about this ark. It is not only the type of the sinner's security in Christ, but look at chapter number 8 and verse 7. Genesis chapter number 8 and verse 7. Now watch carefully with me this morning. I'd like you to get this, please. Genesis chapter number 8 and verse number 7. We read these words. After Noah had been upon the water now for months, they heard the screaming. They'd seen the death and destruction because they could see it in their mind's eye. And even though there were no windows around the sides of the ark and they could not look out upon the water, the only window it had was above them. The only place they could possibly look is when that window was opened in the heaven. They were not allowed to see the horrible carnage that was passing around them. They were safe and secure within that ark. But the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter number 8 and verse number 7, that after that ark had covered a hundred and something days upon the earth, floating above the earth, that Noah now was time to go out and check and see what was out there. He wanted to find if it was a safe haven so he and his people could leave the ark and go out into, into a new world. The Bible says in verse number 7, he sent forth a raven. So he opened up this window in the top, and he climbed up the ladder, and he put his hand forth and he turned loose of the raven. And in verse number 7, the Bible says, the Bible says the raven went forth to and fro, until the waves, till the waters were dried up from off the earth. When he opened up the top of that ark and he turned that raven loose, the scripture says that it began to fly out. And it flew out and it came back and it stopped on top of the ark and it lived there for a while. Then it rested and it got up and it flew out again. And it went out a little further this time and it was hunting, searching, seeking. Then the raven came back. And we don't know how many times the raven left the ark and went out and came back and went out and came back. But eventually the Bible says that the raven left the ark for the last time. And it flew out upon the waters and no doubt found somewhere out there a bloated, floating, dead body. For a raven is a bird that will eat carrion. It will eat that which is already dead. And so this raven, having flown out, found a dead body somewhere floating. And it stayed and did not come back. Moses was totally disappointed. Uh, Aaron, uh, Noah was totally disappointed 
For here he had sent this raven out. It stayed, but he hadn't learned a thing. So now the Bible says, look at carefully in verse number 8. He sent forth a dove to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. She returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand, took her, pulled her in unto him into the ark. Verse 10, stayed yet another seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. He stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. Let's look at the difference. Here this raven goes out and it comes back and it goes out and it comes back and it goes out and it comes back and eventually finds a dead body. Some carcass floating out there and it lights on it. It has found a place now for the sole of its foot and the raven can stay in the midst of its own. For my friend, birds of a feather flock together. Amen. You can tell a lot about a man by the friends he runs with. Amen. You surely can. But the dove went out and came back and went out and came back and the dove could not find a place for its soul. The dead bodies floating around the water absolutely would not be an acceptable place for that dove to light. And the dove would come back and as a matter of fact, the dove had flown so far looking for a place to light that it was evening time when it came back. It had been out all day long. It's a remarkable thing about this dove because the dove is a type of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible says the heavens opened and a dove came down and lit upon him. And the dove was a type of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is likened unto a dove. So the dove must be a clean animal. Absolutely clean. No dirt about it. And he is. Amen. The dove does not eat carrion. It does not eat dead things. The dove will not light on a dead body. The dove will not light on slime. The dove will only light on a clean spot. And so after seven days, Noah sent the dove out again. And this time the dove came back with an olive leaf in his mouth. You say, what is so important about that? Because if you understand something about the olive tree, you'll understand why Noah knew that the, that the world was ready now for him to go into. The olive tree can grow underwater. That's an amazing thing. One of the very few trees that can do that. And the olive tree will never grow above a certain height of elevation. When you get into the highest mountains, you'll never find an olive tree. He'll always be growing down in the lower elevations. So this dove went out, found the olive tree, and that picked the leaf off of it and brought it back to Noah. And when he brought that leaf back to Noah, Noah knew he knew some things. He knew, number one, that the waters had receded down of the side of the mountains far enough for it to be to the point to where the olive tree was growing that that dove could reach him. That meant that Noah could leave that ark and that Noah could find enough flat land, enough land down there where he and his people could set up encampment. But I'll tell you something else about this. That, all, that, that, that uh, dove is a type of the Holy Spirit a type of purity and cleanliness, a type of holiness, where it would never lie on a dead body. You take my friend, someone saved by the grace of God, he has the Holy Spirit indwelling him. But he will not dwell in an unclean vessel. If you're in here lost without God today and you feel things, you may feel them, you may see them, you may experience them, you may know them. But you don't know them by the Holy Spirit. Amen. For if your life is unclean, you can count on this. The Holy Spirit of God is not indwelling in you. Amen. That's why if a man saved by the grace of God, he will chasten him when he gets into the world. Amen. He will straighten him up or kill him. He will not let him live an unclean Amen. life. Amen. You are the habitation of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. The tabernacle, the temple of God. And that Bible says whoever destroys or whoever violates that temple, that tabernacle, him, God will destroy. Amen. The Holy Spirit, my Amen. friend, is so sweet and so precious Amen. to fly out and fly over the dead bodies because there's really nothing there to use anyway. 
and pick that olive and bring it back. You know, the olive tree is a remarkable thing. Only grow about 30 feet in height. Doesn't get real big compared to some trees. But it has characteristics that no other tree has. It can grow underwater, as I've said. But it also produces the olive. The olive, once squeezed, produces the olive oil. The olive oil is also another type of the Holy Spirit of God. The olive oil is used for lighting. The olive oil is used for the balm. It's used for healing. The olive oil is very beneficial to mankind. So what he was saying when he brought back that little olive leaf to Noah, he was saying, Noah, we not only have land that we can go to now, but look what I've got, Noah. Look what I've got. This tree right here represents the tree of life. We've got a new world to go into, Noah. There's a new world out there and it's waiting for you. Are you ready to go into it? And after a year on the waters and on the mountain, he was ready to go. Now there's something else about this dove. In Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 16, the Bible says, Be ye harmless as doves, wise as serpents. So the dove is not only a type of the Holy Spirit, the dove is a type of the believer. And that's rightly so. Amen. If anybody ought to be clean, it ought to be God's people. Amen. If anybody ought to be pure and holy, it ought to be God's people. The Bible says that we serve him in the beauty of holiness. Now there's something about holiness that separates us from the rest of the world. Believers are separate and holy. And holiness is not a bad word. Holiness is not a fanatical word. Amen. Holiness is a Bible word. But notice, notice what a beautiful thing you have. In verse number 9, Genesis 8. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Now I want you to stop for just a moment. The raven had gone out already and found a place. The raven had already stopped out there on some dead carcasses. And was eating and feasting. It was enjoying the carrion of the earth. The raven was ready to live in the midst of death and suffering and decay and morbidity. The raven could be right at home. The raven represents the lost man, a man lost without God. He may be religious. He may be doing the best he can, but he is perfectly at home in a world lost without God. He's at home there, folks. He can rub shoulders with them. He can talk with them. He can live with them. He can let their stench rub off on him and let his stench rub off on them because they're just the same. But that little dove could never be part of that. And he got tired. Look at verse 8. He'd flown out so far and he was tired. And she came back to the ark. And she came back tired to the ark. And watch carefully what your Bible says in verse 8. Verse 9. The Bible says the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. She returned unto him to the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in to him to the ark. She got just as far as she could make it. She was worn completely out. And Noah had to stick that hand up there and say, here, right here. And she just made it to his hand. And he took that little dove and he brought her into the ark. That's the believer. That's the believer. Amen. You remember the old boy who was taking his inheritance and went off into a far country and spent it on riotous living. Yeah. He had a big time. But the Bible says that he, found, he wound up eating husk with the hogs. And he'd raised his head up that day and he came to himself and he said, the servants in my father's house are better off than I am. I will arise and go to my father. Amen. I believe when he made it to his father and he saw his father afar off, he was just about as far as he could go. He was in rags. He was as low as he ever got in his life. And I'll tell you the truth, if his father had turned away from him that day, the only thing that had been left for him was to fall in his tracks and die. But the father welcomed him when he came on home. You can get so far from God that you're so tired, you're so beaten, you're so defeated, you're so drugged down that you think you can never get back to God. Amen. Remember this. 
care how tired you are, care how far you think it is, back to the Father, that hand will reach out Amen. and let you light on it. Amen. And I can hear that little dove as she lit on that hand. Amen. I just made it back. And then she comes safely once again Amen. into the ark. I'm going to tell you right now, now, listen to me, listen to me well. You're not safe unless you're in the ark. Amen. You're not safe unless you're in the ark. Christian, if you've flown away from that ark and you're out here in the world, you're lighting on dead carcasses, you're rubbing shoulders with the lost, you're living with them, you're running with them, you're grinding with them, you'll suffer with them. And God will chasten you that you won't be condemned with them. Amen. And if he doesn't chasten you, you don't know them a bit more than you ever thought you did. I saw some people the other day. Quit, church. Quit. Just quit. Quit. Walked out the door. You know them, but I won't tell you who it is. There's no need in that. How you doing? Oh, fine. Everything's going so good. They said. Oh, talked about the family. Talked about the children, grandchildren. Talked about how good everything was going. I sat down and I said to myself, something wrong. Something bad, bad wrong. Because you flew out of that ark. And nothing bad happened to them, too, when they flew out of that ark. But they flew out and they flew off. And everything is doing so well with them. There's no problem. Matter of fact, things have been going better now if they're out of church than they were when they were in church. I looked over at Linda and I said, these people right here never, ever knew who he was. They went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they no doubt would have stayed with us, but they went out from us that it may be made known that they were not of us. Every one of you here today, folks, if you're born again, you belong to him, you belong to him forever, and you can never get out there and run with that crowd. You cannot let that stench get on you. You'll never be able to rest on a dead carcass floating on the water and be happy. You won't do it. You're going to get up and you're going to start flying and you're going to get up there and you're going to try to get back to God and you're going to think, oh, God is so far from me. There's no way I've done it. I've ruined my life. There's no, he's too far. I can't reach him. That little hand will come about and he'll say, come to me, all of you that labor and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Me, find me. Come on, little You shall find rest for your souls. Aren't you glad, sinners? That we've got one we can flee to and find peace and safety in the ark. I don't deserve to go up in the rapture. I really don't. I don't deserve the goodness of God and what God has in store for me. I don't deserve it. But it's not an issue of whether you deserve it or not. Jesus Christ deserved it. And we are blessed, loved with the beloved. We are accepted with him. Amen. And when God accepted the son, he accepted you. And it won't be long before we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account for our lives. Don't waste these last few years and throw them away. Amen. When we're coming down to the end, don't quit now. We're too close. Amen. Don't fly off into this whole world. I beg and plead with you. I know it's getting harder and I know the deception's worse. I know that. There's a lot of forces pulling at you, but we're just about home. Amen. And all I can say to you this morning is Amen. stay there. Wait until you find Amen. that olive tree. Get a light on it. Amen. And then take that blessed olive oil and the beauty of that tree and eat and drink to your heart's desire. Amen. In plain words, let the Lord feed you, not this world. Amen. Come before his table and ask him to spread you a table in the wilderness. Amen. You'll do it. Amen. Ask him to feed your soul. Ask him to give you strength for tomorrow. Ask him to increase your faith as one said, Lord, help my unbelief. Amen. Come to him. Would you do it? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, we have an ark that keeps us safe. And oh God, I can sense in my soul your anger. I can tell from what I read in Revelation chapter number 6, when they say hide us from the face of the Lamb, there's anger. Oh God, thank you that we don't have to face that anger. But Lord, that little hand is stuck out for us, and all we've got to do is just get to that. And you'll pull us right back in. In Jesus' name we pray.